Chapter 23 Agrisomnia The following day, the 10th of January, the Nautilus continued her course between two seas, but with such remarkable speed that I could not estimate it at less than 35 miles an hour. The rapidity of her screw was such that I could neither follow nor count its evolutions. When I reflected that this marvelous electric agent, after having afforded motion, heat, and night light to the Nautilus, still protected her from outward attack and transformed her into an arc of safety, which no profane hand might touch without being thunder-stricken, my admiration was unbounded, and from the structure it extended to the engineer who had called it into existence. Our course was directed to the west, and on the 11th of January, we doubled Cape Wessel, situated in 135 degrees longitude and 10 degrees north latitude, which forms the east point of the Gulf of Carpentaria. The reefs were still numerous, but more equalized and marked on the chart with extreme precision. The Nautilus easily avoided the breakers of money to port, and the Victoria reefs to starboard placed at 130 degrees longitude and on the 10th parallel, which we strictly followed. On the 13th of January, Captain Nemo arrived in the Sea of Timor and recognized the island of that name in 122 degrees longitude. From this point, the direction of the Nautilus inclined towards the southwest. Her hand was set for the Indian Ocean. Where would the fancy of Captain Nemo carry us next? Would he return to the coast of Asia? Or would he approach again the shores of Europe? Improbable conjectures both for a man who fled from inhabited continents. Then would he descend to the south? Was he going to double the Cape of Good Hope, then Cape Horn, and finally go as far as the Antarctic Pole? Would he come back at last to the Pacific, where his Nautilus could sail free and independently? Time would show. After having skirted the sands of Cardia, of Hibernia, Serenipatum, and, and Scott, last efforts of the solid against the liquid element, on the 14th of January, we lost sight of land altogether. The speed of the Nautilus was considerably abated, and with irregular course, she sometimes swam in the bosom of the waters and sometimes floated on the surface. During this period of the voyage, Captain Nemo made some interesting experiments on the very temperature of the sea in different beds. Under ordinary conditions, these observations are made by means of rather complicated instruments and with somewhat doubtful results by be means of thermometrical sounding leads. The glass is often breaking under the pressure of the water or an apparatus grounded on the variations of the resistance of metals to the electric currents. Results so obtained could not be correctly calculated. On the contrary, Captain Nemo went himself to test the temperature in the depths of the sea and his thermometer placed in communication with the different sheets of paper gave him the required degree immediately and accurately. It was thus that either by overloading her reservoirs or by descending oblique, obliquely by means of her inclined planes, the Nautilus successfully attained the depth of three, four, five, seven, nine, and 10,000 yards. And the definite results of this experience was that the sea preserved an average temperature of four degrees and a half at a depth of 5,000 fathoms under all latitudes. On the 16th of January, the Nautilus seemed becalmed. Only a few yards beneath the surface of the waves, her electric apparatus remained inactive and her motionless screw left her to drift at the mercy of the currents. I suppose that the screw was occupied with interior repairs rendered necessary by the violence of the mechanical moments of the machine. My companions and I then witnessed a curious spectacle. The hatches of the saloon were open, and as the beacon light of the Nautilus was not in action, a dim obscurity reigned in the midst of the waters. I observed the state of the sea under these conditions, and the largest fish appeared to me no more than scarcely defined shadows. When the Nautilus found herself suddenly transported into full light, I thought at first that the beacon had been lighted and was casting its electric radiance into the liquid mast. I was mistaken, and after a rapid survey, perceived my error. Well, the Nautilus had floated in the midst of a phosphorescent bed, which in this obscurity became quite dazzling. It was produced by myriads of luminous animaliculi, 
whose brilliancy was increased as they glided over the metallic hull of the vessel. I was surprised by lighting in the midst of these luminous sheets, as though they had been rivulets of lead melted in an ardent furnace, or metallic masses brought to a white heat, so that, by force of contrast, certain portions of light appeared to cast a shade in the midst of the general ignition, from which all shades seemed banished. No, this was not the calm irradiation of our ordinary lighting. There was unusual life and vigor. This was truly living light. In reality, it was an infinite agglomeration of colored infosphoria, of vertebral globules of diaphanesis jelly, provided with a thread-like tentacle, and of which as many as 25,000 have been counted in less than two cubic half inches of water and their light was increased by the glimmering peculiar to the medusa, starfish, aralea, and other phosphorescent zoophytes, impregnated by the grease of the organic matter decomposed by the sea, and perhaps the mucus secreted by the fish. During several hours, the Nautilus floated in these brilliant waves, and our admiration increased as we watched the marine monsters disporting themselves like salamanders. I saw there in the midst of this fire that burns not the swift and elegant porpoise, the indefatigable clown of the ocean, and some swordfish ten feet long whose prophetic heralds of the hurricane, whose formidable sword would now and then strike the glass of the saloon. Then appeared the smaller fish, the variegated ballista, the leaping mackerel, wolf thorn tails, and a hundred others which striped the luminous atmosphere as they swam. This dazzling spectacle was enchanting. Perhaps some atmospheric conditions increased the intensity of this phenomenon. Perhaps some storm agitated the surface of the waves, but at this depth of some yards, the Nautilus was unmoved by its fury and reposed peacefully in still water. As we progressed, incessantly charmed by some new marvel, Council arranged and classified the zoophytes. His articulata, his mollusks, his fishes. The days passed rapidly away and I took no account of them. Ned, according to habit, tried to vary the diet on board. Like snails, we were fixed to our shells, and I declare it is easy to lead a snail's life. Thus, this life seemed easy and natural, and we thought no longer of the life we led on land. But something happened to recall us to the strangeness of our situation. On the 18th of January, the Nautilus was in 105 degrees longitude and 15 degrees south latitude. The weather was threatening, the sea rough and rolling. There was a strong east wind, the barometer, which had been going down for some days, foreboded a coming storm. I went on to the platform just as the second lieutenant was taking the measure of the hoary angles and waited, according to habit, till the daily phrase was said. But on this day, it was exchanged for another phrase, not less incomprehensible. Almost directly, I saw Captain Nemo appear with a glass looking towards the horizon. For some minutes, he was immovable without taking his eye off the point of observation. Then he lowered his glass and exchanged a few words with his lieutenant. The latter seemed to be a victim to some emotion that he tried in vain to repress. Captain Nemo, having more command over himself, was cool. He seemed, too, to be making some objections to which the lieutenant replied by formal assurances. At least I concluded so by the difference of their tones and gestures. For myself, I had looked carefully in the direction indicated without seeing anything. The sky and water were lost in the clear line of the horizon. However, Captain Nemo ma walked from one end of the platform to the other without looking at me, perhaps without seeing me. His step was firm, but less regular than usual, and he stopped sometimes, crossed his arms, and observed the sea. What could he be looking for on that immense expanse? The Nautilus was in some hundreds of miles from the nearest coast. The lieutenant had taken up the glass and examined the horizon steadfastly going and coming stamping his foot and showing more nervous agitation than his superior officer. Besides, this mystery must necessarily be solved, and before long, for upon an order from Captain Nemo, the engine, increasing its propelling power, made the screw torn more, turn more rapidly. 
Just then, the lieutenant drew the captain's attention away. The latter stopped walking and directed his glass toward the place indicated. He looked long. I felt very much puzzled and descended to the drawing room and took out an excellent telescope that I generally used. Then, leaning on the cage of the watchlight that jutted out from the front of the platform, set myself to look over all the line of the sky and sea. But my eye was no longer applied to the glass. Then it was quickly snatched out of my hand. I turned around. Captain Nemo was before me, but I did not know him. His face was transfigured. His eyes flashed sullenly. His teeth were set. His stiff body clenched fists and head shrunk between his shoulders. Betrayed the violent agitation that pervaded his whole frame. He did not move. My glass, fallen from his hands, had rolled at his feet. Had I unwittingly provoked his fit of anger? Did this incomprehensible person imagine that I had discovered some forbidden secret? No. I was not the object of his hatred, for he was not looking at me. His eye was steadily fixed upon the impenetrable point of the horizon. At last, Captain Nemo recovered himself. His agitation subsided. He addressed some words in a foreign language to his lieutenant, then turned to me. M. Ironel, he said, in rather an imperious tone. I require you to keep one of the conditions that bind you to me. What is it, Captain? You must be confined with your companions until I think fit to release you. You are the master, I replied, looking steadily at him. But may I ask you one question? None, sir. There was no resisting this imperious command. It would have been useless. I went down to the cabin occupied by Ned, Land, and Council and told them the captain's determination. You may judge how this communication was received by the Canadian, but there was no time for alter altercation. Four of the crew waited at the door and conducted us to that cell where we had passed our first night on board the Nautilus. Ned Land would have remonstrated, but the door was shut upon him. Will Master tell me what this means? asked Council. I told my companions what had passed, and they were as much astonished as I, and equally at a loss how to account for it. Meanwhile, I was absorbed in my own reflections, and could think of nothing but the strange fear depicted in the captain's countenance. I was utterly at a loss to account for it. When my cogitations were disturbed by these words from Ned Land, Hello! Breakfast is ready! And indeed, the table was laid. Evidently, Captain Nemo had given his order at the same time that he had hastened the speed of the Nautilus. Will Master permit me to make a recommendation? asked Council. Yes, my boy. Well, it is that Master breakfasts. It is prudent, for we do not know what may happen. Well, you're right, Council. Unfortunately, said Ned Land, they have only given us the ship's fare. Ned Land... Fred Ned asked Council, what would you have asked if the breakfast had been entirely forgotten? The argument cut short the harpooner's rec recriminations. We sat down to table. The meal was eaten in silence, and just then the luminous globe that lighted the cell went out and left us in total darkness. Ned Land was soon asleep, and what astonished me was that Council went off into a heavy sleep, and I, I was thinking, what it could have caused this irresistible drowsiness, when I felt my brain become stupefied. In spite of my efforts to keep my eyes open, they would close. A painful suspicion seized me. Evidently, soporific substances had been mixed with the food we had just taken. Imprisonment was not enough to conceal Captain Nemo's projects from us. Sleep was more necessary. I then heard the panel shut the undulations of the sea, which caused a slight rolling motion, ceased. Had the Nautilus quitted the surface of the ocean? Had it gone back to the motionless bed of water? I tried to resist sleep, and it was impossible. My breathing grew weak. I, I felt a mortal cold freeze my, my stiffened, half-paralyzed limbs. My eyelids like leaden caps fell over my eyes. I could not raise them I, a morbid sleep, full of hallucinations befit me of my being. Then the visions disappeared and left me in complete insensibility.